so much. Thank you so much, Steve Banner. Okay. My name is Steve Wolf, and thank you so much. I have the most exciting job in the world, actually two of them. First, I set up stunts and special effects for movies and television shows, which means that it's my job to light people on fire, blow up cars, throw stunt people off buildings, make things explode. And then I have an equally dangerous job where I go into classrooms and I teach science to, to kids in uh, full school assemblies, showing kids how all of the stunts and special effects that they see in movies and television shows are all actually based on science and safety. So what I want to do today is show you some of the ways that I use the science that I learned when I was in elementary school to set up movie stunts and special effects. Now, a few years ago, I got to work with an actor named Tom Cruise, and we did a movie called The Firm together. And I was sitting there thinking about how much money Tom was making. <laughs> I figured out that he was making about $100,000 every single day that he came to work. I thought, boy, if I got a hundred thousand dollars, that's, that's, I mean, that's as much as it takes some of these UT professors months and months to make. <laughs> and he's making that much money in one day. So I thought, gee, I would never want to miss a day of work if I could get a hundred thousand dollars a day. And I asked him, how do you make sure that you're always healthy enough to come to work? I asked him and I asked several of the other actors on that set the same question. I asked Gene Hackman and Holly Hunter and... They all came up with this similar list, which I call my, my movie star tips. And they told me if you want to make sure you can get to work every day, you just eat healthy foods, you get plenty of sleep, you get a lot of exercise, you stay away from drugs and alcohol, and you stay away from smoke and from cigarettes. When I asked Tom, why do you stay away from the smoke and the cigarettes, is it because it's unhealthy also? And he said, no, because it's disgusting. <laughs> so. By doing those five things, you put the odds of good health in your favor. So when I was reading the script for the firm, and I saw that the first scene we were going to be filming was a scene where Tom and his wife were having dinner in a smoky restaurant, I knew right away we had our first big science challenge. How are we going to make it look like we're in a room full of smoke when we couldn't have any real smoke in there? And the way we do that is by going back to some really simple basic science, and we go back to the principle of the three states of matter, right? Which says that we break up pretty much all the stuff in the world into one of three states. Kind of like ice cream comes in what? We have chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. strawberry. Well, most of the stuff that the world is made of comes as either a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now, that doesn't mean that those are the only forms that things come in, but that's most of what you find. You've got Rocky Road ice cream, you've got plasma, but mostly chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Of course, the most important being chocolate. So when we want to set something to look really smoky in a movie, what I do is I take this machine here, which has ingeniously been named a smoke machine, and I let it do what it does best, which is to add liquid and heat together so that we can change a liquid into a gas. And the way this machine does that, it just adds a lot of heat, and when you get a lot of heat, the molecules inside the liquid start moving really fast, and they fly away from each other, creating a gas. And I'm going to show you how this machine works, all right? No way. Yeah, I sure will. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take two drops of liquid right now. Imagine how little two drops is, okay? How close those molecules are. They're actually all touching each other, but they slide over each other. I'm going to take two drops of liquid and turn them into a gas. Ready? Here's one drop, and there's a second drop. So from just two drops of liquid, we can actually create enough smoke to fill this building. We can fill this room, and look, you see how it's already gone up and it's reaching the lights? And it makes a very different atmosphere in here, doesn't it? It could look like a room that's full of smoke. It could look like a funky discotheque. You could see the light 
reflecting off those molecules. And if you watch towards the back of the room, you're going to see the smoke particles, which are really just the particles that came from this liquid working their way back. It's quite pretty, I think. And that is all made by just two drops. So you can imagine how much expansion you get when you turn something from a liquid or a gas, a liquid or a, uh, a what? A solid into a gas. It gets very big. And actually, we've filled the whole room now. Now, how do you know that what you're breathing is safe to breathe? You don't, do you? You're going to take it on faith, right? Because the difference between this stuff and real smoke is that this stuff is safe to breathe. But when you're working with chemicals, you need to verify that for yourself. And the way you do that is by reading labels. All right? So you always check the label if you're working with materials. And you check, and it says right on here, this product is safe for human inhalation. What does that mean? Safe to breathe, that's right. Hey, I never saw that. It says prolonged exposure may cause hair loss. Oh, come on. You can't believe everything you read, right? I mean, I've been doing this 17 years, and maybe there's something to it. I don't know. I'm just curious. Putting all this smoke in the air makes me wonder, how many of you have heard an expression about smoke that says, where there's smoke, there's fire, fire right? And I have to make fire probably 80% of the days that I go to work. I either have to have candles on a table, or I've got to have a fire burning in a fireplace, or I'm actually lighting a whole building on fire. But regardless, it all comes down to having four basic components that I have to have to make fire. Just like if I was going to make a cake, I have to have butter, flour, sugar, eggs. I've got my ingredients, and then I have my procedures. Bake at 475 for three and a half hours. <laughs> Discard. <laughs> Try again, right? To make fire, I have to have fuel and oxygen. I have to have heat, and I have to have a chemical reaction. And if you bring together fuel, oxygen, heat, and a chemical reaction, you get fire. fire. Yes. Now, if when I was working on Castaway, if we could have taught Tom Hanks that all you needed was the fuel, oxygen, heat, and the chemical reaction, we could have cut 90 minutes out of that movie and I think <laughs> made a better picture. Now, the chemical reaction is just when we take two different ingredients, the two components, which scientists call reactants, and we allow them to interact with each other chemically so that they make something new. I'm going to show you how we do this in a movie set. By the way, when we set a house on fire in a movie, we don't use a real house, because a real house burns down in about 20 minutes. And we need our movie house to stay on fire for two or three weeks sometimes. I did. <laughs> I did a movie called A Time to Kill, and we actually had to burn the house every day for three weeks in order to get all the shots that we needed to make that work. So we actually build the house out of materials that are non-flammable. What's that mean? It can't burn, right? An example would be metal. Metal's non-flammable. So what we're really burning is this fuel down here. It's a gas, and it's called... How many watch King of the Hill here? Yes, propane. <laughs> Formerly, the chemical name is Sweet Lady Propane, though, according to Hank Hill. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of the fuel that's in this tank here, and I'm going to open up a valve. When I open up this valve, some fuel's going to start coming out of here. Oh, I hear it. I hear it coming down. And can we get a bigger fire? Yeah. yeah. Yeah? What if we open the valve some more? Can we get a bigger fire? Yeah. 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 We can actually control exactly what this fire does by controlling the flow of the fuel to it. We can make it go little or we can make it go big. We have complete control over it because I've got this valve here. So I can decide whether I want the fire coming out just one place or whether we want it coming out the whole house. We're not getting a lot of fire out of this, are we? 
Let's see if we can tighten that up. All right. There we go. Oh, that's much more fun. That's more exciting. Okay. Now that, that may look like a big scary house on fire, but if it gets too big, you see what I can do? I can shut it right off because I keep my hand on the valve there. Can I get it to go big again? Yeah. 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 I'll turn the valve back on and bring it back. You know what else I can do besides just controlling the size of it? I can put the fire right where I want it. I could move all the fire upstairs. I could move all the fire over to that side. I could bring the fire back over here. Come here, fire. Come to me. No, go back over there. I can control it by using valves. Now, valves are simple mechanical devices that control the flow of fluids. And what's a fluid? I'll give you a hint, all right? Two out of the three states of matter are fluids. And I'll give you another hint. Solids are not one of them. <laughs> All right? Yeah. Fluids, yeah, are gases and liquids. Fluids are materials that take the shape of the container you put them in. Now, if you pour milk in a glass, the milk takes the shape of the glass, right? So it's a fluid. You take air, you put it in a balloon, the air takes the shape of the balloon, it's a fluid. Put a brick in a bucket. Does the brick take the shape of the bucket? Yeah. Then I guess it's not a fluid. It's a solid. So I control fluids by using valves. I'm just curious, how many of you used a valve today to control the flow of a fluid? How many of you brushed your teeth this morning? Yeah. You brushed your teeth? I'm s I bet the people sitting around you are very happy to know that. All right. Now, what do we want to get rid of a fire? We have to take away one of the four ingredients. We have to take away either the fuel, the oxygen, the heat, or the chemical reaction. Which is the easiest one to take away here? Take away the fuel by closing a valve. And I take away the fuel, the last little bit of fuel in the line burns off, and the fire goes out. Very safe, very controllable. And, this, and nobody got hurt here, right? With the exception of my, my pretty firehouse, which my crew spent a long time polishing this morning and now all for naught. Take a look at this. If I take a nice clean napkin here. Oh my goodness. Does this remind anyone of their kids' rooms? <laughs> Two minutes of play and it's a complete pigsty. Look at that. You know what that is? This is proof that we had a chemical reaction here today because this stuff wasn't here to begin with, was it? That means we must have made this stuff. You know what this is? This is a chemical called carbon. And do you know what this could do to you? Could this kill you? If a thousand pounds of it fell on you, it sure could. But you know what? Other than that, this stuff is pretty harmless. The worst it could do is get your clothing very dirty. You can get in trouble for that. But that's the worst of it. In fact, all life on Earth is based on this stuff. It's called carbon, right? Did you know that 20% of your bodies are made out of carbon? This is good stuff. But you know what? Carbon is not the only thing we made today. We made another chemical that I want to show you. But I can't because it's invisible. We made this other stuff that is a gas that is poisonous. See, when you have a house on fire, the fire has a chemical reaction that makes poison gases. And it's not the fire in a house on fire that kills people, it's the poison gases. It's the carbon monoxide. So it's very, very important to remember, if there's ever a fire in your house, the first thing that you do is get out of the house. Get out of the house. If there's a fire, you get out. And once you're outside of the house, then you can dial 911 from a neighbor's house or a cell phone or a cordless house. But the first thing that you need to do is what? Get out of the house. That's right. Now, why do you think we set houses on fire in movies? 
Because it's cool. It makes the movie exciting, right? Well, what would make it more exciting than just having a house on fire? What are the people in the house, right? We got to add the human drama factor. So what are we going to do with our person in the house now? Have them get stuck in the house and they can't get out, right? So they're inside the house. And they can't get out because the doors are blocked. And then they go upstairs and they can't get out because the windows are blocked. So now they race up the stairs to get away from the fire. And they find themselves out on the roof. And now they've got fire licking up all around them, from behind them, from above them, all around. There's only one way to get away. What are they going to have to do? They're going to have to jump off the roof and fall all the way to the ground. Now, as a job, this is probably the greatest thing you could have for a stunt person. It's a great job for anybody because it doesn't matter whether that roof is 10 feet tall or 300 feet tall. All the stunt person really has to do is take one step. <laughs> and what does the work of getting them from the roof all the way down to the ground? Gravity. What pulls them down? Gravity. Now this is stealing your money, isn't it? <laughs> you take one step, gravity does all the work, and you get to keep all the money. <laughs> now why wouldn't everyone want a job like that? You know why? Because some people think that it's dangerous to fall two or three hundred feet for your job. But to be perfectly honest, I've been, in, in 17 years, I have never seen anyone get hurt falling. Now, I mean, I've seen some people get killed when they landed, but that is, that is a different part of the stunt. As, as long as you're falling, you're safe. In fact, we, we put radios on the stunt guys and we talk to them on their way down and it, as they're about halfway through this fall, you say, how's it going? And they say, so far, so good. So it's when you get to the bottom you have to worry about. And part of my job is to make sure that the stunt people, when they fall, never have what I call a Humpty Dumpty landing. We don't want anybody <laughs> splatting on the sidewalk. So when our stunt people land, Rather than have them land on the sidewalk, we usually have them land in a giant bag about the size of this room full of air. And the reason we can land on air is because air is a gas, and gases are compressible. That means they can be squeezed down like a spring. So when you land on a bag full of air, the energy from your fall is absorbed by squeezing this giant bag, and it's kind of like landing on an enormous pile of marshmallows, and it just goes... <gasps> <laughs> and it brings you to a nice, slow landing. So now gravity's doing all the work of getting you down from the roof. The airbag is doing all the work of catching you. What's left to figure out? How to get back up to the top of the building. Because a stunt is not a daredevil feat. Daredevils, if they get killed in the process, it's part of the show. But stunt people are professionals, and we are scientists. And that means what we do needs to be predictable, controllable, and repeatable. That means every time I jump off that roof, I want to come up with the same results, which is that I walk away unharmed. So we have to put some science into that. How are we going to get our stunt person back up to the roof so they can do it again? Pulleys, stairs, helicopters. Elevators. Yes, elevators. When you have to get to the top of a tall building, I think the simplest way is to take an elevator. And Einstein said that things should always be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. <laughs> so if an elevator is an option, absolutely take it. But very often we find ourselves in a situation where there is no elevator because we're filming at the top of a cliff or we're filming at the edge of a crevice. And we have to have a way to get a stunt person from the bottom of that deep crevice, which is a crack in the earth, back up so we can drop them down there again. <laughs>
And the way we do that is by being able to build simple machines right there on the set. Simple machines don't have moving parts and they don't need electricity and they don't have big diesel motors. They are simple, basic principles of science that essentially multiply your strength. And there's six simple machines. We've got things like levers, ramps, wheels and axles, pulleys, wedges. Anything else? Exercise. Screws, that's right. So you've got those six simple machines, and all machines are basically combinations of those six simple machines. But absolutely my favorite of the machines is the pulley. And a pulley is simply a wheel that has a rope wrapped around it. Now, I first read about pulleys when I was in fourth grade, and I had a science teacher who made a drawing of some pulleys on the blackboard, and she said that if you had a bunch of pulleys, you could actually lift things that were heavier than you are. Now, I just, you know, innately knew that to not be possible, and I had to prove it to myself. So I actually got a job after school in fourth grade so I could make enough money to buy myself a set of pulleys. And these are the original pulleys that I've been dragging around for the last 28 years. I got these pulleys at a boating store, a little marina, and I brought them home and I started a tinker with how they worked. And I noticed that one pulley just changes the direction and the force of a rope. And I noticed if I pulled down with about 10 pounds of force on this side, the other side went up with about 10 pounds of force. But according to what my teacher told me, if I used more than one pulley, my strength would be multiplied by the number of pulleys that I used. So I got these pulleys home, and I set them up on a tree branch, kind of like this. And I set the rest of them up down here. And then I went in my house to look for something really heavy to lift to see if this works. And what do you think the first thing I came across was? My mom. And I said, Mom, I got these pulleys, and I've got them hooked up just the way they showed in the book. And uh, could you come outside and let me attach you to them and see if it'll lift you up? And I could see I wasn't getting too far with this argument. But you know what? She came outside, and she looked up, and she looked down. And being a good mom, she thought that probably the greatest thing she could do would be to contribute to the excitement of my education. So she agreed to put on a harness and let me strap her to these pulleys and pull her up into the air. And I want to reenact that fateful moment for you. Let's see. Who have I got that might be a big guy? Let's see. A big, heavy guy. How much do you weigh? 110, 120, 111, 205. Hey, Mr. Banner, would you come with me, please, for a minute? Look at this. Wow, I got the mighty Jay Banner. Woo! Now, Jay, I, I noticed uh, that's some pretty interesting underwear you've changed into. And I think it looks good. You wear it on the outside, and that way you can make sure it's clean, right? You know what to change it, right? That's great. Okay. What this is actually is, of course, a professional movie harness. In fact, this is the same harness that Tom Cruise wore in the movie The Firm. So I'm going to call him later tonight, and he'd be very disappointed if I don't get your autograph to send to him. He he's asked me to keep up with who wears this harness. This harness is actually made out of a very, very strong material. It's made out of a material called nylon webbing. And when I say something is strong, I'm talking about how much you could pull on it without breaking it. You know what this material is made for? It's made for seat belts. So it's really strong. You can actually wear professional grade stunt equipment every time you get in the car just by doing what? <laughs> Putting on your seat belt, right. Now, when we pull on something and we measure how much weight it can hold, what we're talking about is a property of matter called tensile strength. And the tensile strength of this material here is 6,000 pounds. Wow. So you should feel perfectly comfortable in that harness. The harness won't break. Now, 
Of course, the rope has a tensile strength of only about 400 pounds. And of course, that reminds us, when we're looking at a system and we want to know its cumulative tensile strength, we don't look at the strongest part. We look at what? The weakest link. A chain's only as strong as the weakest link, which is not you, so not to worry. You will not be kicked off this show. All right, would you come stand right behind here? Now, I've got these really strong metal clips here. They're called carabiners, and I'm going to lock them to Mr. Banner here. Why do we lock that in there? So he won't fall. Yeah, that's right. We're going to make sure he doesn't run away. <laughs> now, the next thing I'm going to need are some volunteers. Would you three come up here? You come up here as well. Okay. Now, do you all know the story of Humpty Dumpty? You know the story of Jack and the Beanstalk? Okay, this is the beanstalk, and I want you to gather around it. Okay. Everybody get a piece of that rope. I mean that beanstalk. Okay. And what I'd like you to do, while Mr. Banner holds on to the sides of this, is you all are going to just start pulling on that rope, and we're going to see what happens. Ready? Go ahead. Now, team, come on up here a little closer. Oh, my goodness. Is the floor compressible? Wow. That is a very, oh my goodness, you know what? Look at, how is it up there? Woo! So, we're getting them up there, but you know what? I, I'm not surprised, because I, I bet the six of you could pick up Mr. Banner without all those pulleys, right? You don't think so? Let's find out. I want to find out what happened if we, if we were to take a really little person. Could you come up here, please? Because, you know, I forgot something. I forgot that since we've got a stunt person up in the air, under, in great danger, we need to make sure there's something nice and soft underneath in case he falls. There we go. Okay. Oh, you know what? We better put a helmet on you just in case, right? You like blue? Yeah, blue a good color for you? Okay, we'll tighten that on there. There we go. Is that comfortable? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, let me take part of this rope here. And I'm going to tie a knot in that. I'm going to give you this rope. And with this rope, you know what? You have a lot of responsibility. Okay? Responsibility means that if you're in charge of something, no matter what happens, it's on your head. Okay. Now, I'm going to let go of this rope, and Paxton here is going to see if he can hold Mr. Banner up all by himself. Are you ready? One, two, three. Look at that. You got to step back a little bit. <laughs> Very nice. So, good job, Paxton. Excellent work. So right now, you saw how Using pulleys, a boy who weighs only about 50 pounds was able to hold up a man who weighs enough to teach classrooms with as many as 300 students in them. <laughs> that is terrific. Should we bring you back down? No. Yeah. Please. Okay, let go. Let go. Now, I have a science extra credit question for you. What would happen to the inside of my hand if I were to allow this rope to slide very quickly through my hand. I'd get a rope burn, wouldn't I? You know why? Because when things rub together, they create friction. Friction creates heat, and heat does what to people? Burns them. So I want to make sure I don't make any friction here, and we gently lower Mr. Banner hand over hand. I'd like you to bend your knees so we get a lot of slack as you land. And you can stand up very gently, very smoothly. Nice landing. Okay. And now the most fun part is I have a team of young ladies who will help you out of this harness. <laughs> okay. Now, normally we don't let stuntmen, and thank you guys, that was great. We don't normally let stunt people go home so fast because... They get paid a lot of money. They get paid 650 bucks just to show up in the morning, and then you have to pay them more if you actually want any work out of them. That's a pretty good union, huh? 
So typically one might go from a stunt like that to blowing stuff up. And I know none of you probably, I'm going to skip that because I know there's nobody here who came to see anything blow up, right? All right, I'll, I'll show you how we blow stuff up. First of all, blowing something up literally means blowing it up. If you want to blow something up, what you have to start with is getting a bunch of air, getting a bunch of gas. And I use this machine right here very often when I have to blow things up. Let me lift this up for you. What this machine is, it's just a compressor that I bought at a hardware store. It's got a valve over here, and it's got a barrel at the top of it. Now, what a compressor does is it just takes air, in fact, air that I got from this room, I borrowed a little UT air, and that compressor, working slowly over a period of time, packs a whole bunch of air into this tank here. And these air molecules are all bumping around in there, bumping against each other and bumping against the tank. They're bumping against the sides and the top and the bottom, all pushing in opposite directions. But when I open up a valve, all the air molecules can race out of here, and instead of exerting pressure, which works in different directions, they all start to go in the same direction, and that turns a pressure into a force. So this machine just turns pressure, which is forces acting against the surface, into a force where it all goes in one direction. Now, I want to find out whether we could get as much work out of some air as we could out of one of the strongest men in here, <laughs> Mr. Steve Bredding, from what high school? You're from Westwood, Westwood High School? Yeah. Pretty strong guy, huh? We'll see. All right. Pink or blue? It's not a trick. Pink is fine. All right. You throw the pink one, and my friend, Senor Air Canon, we give him the blue one, all right? Now, you see that guy back up there right next to the cameraman? Yeah. Roger. How did oh. you know? Yes. Psychotic. I'm psychotic. Wow. That's Roger Moorfield. <laughs> okay. Roger, would you put your arms up in the air? And what I'd like you to do is just throw that ball right through his arms. Ready? Three, two, one. Action. <laughs> that, was, that was a darn good try, I have to say. Okay. You know what happens? That ball has very low mass. It has a lot of surface area. And when it runs through the air, that creates a lot of friction, and so all the energy from your mighty throw there just got turned into heat and let that ball drop right here. Hmm. You didn't drop the ball, all right? The air did. Okay, you did the best you could. Now, stay right here. Let's, let's make this a fair competition, all right? I want to find out what happens when we let air try the same thing. So we've got all this air in here, all pushing in different directions, kind of like kids on a school bus, if the bus broke down and they get off to help and half push from the front and half push from the back, they don't get anywhere even though they're all working really hard, right? So in order to actually get anything done, you all have to go in the same direction. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a valve here. And this valve here, unlike the valves on my firehouse, this valve we open and close using electricity. So I'm going to plug this valve in here. <laughs> thought we had that fixed last time. <laughs> All right. This valve that opens and closes with electricity, it's called a solenoid valve. And in the event of an emergency where you ever had to throw something using air and you had to find a solenoid valve, there's at least three of them in your house. One of them is underneath the dishwasher, and two of them are inside your clothes washer. But don't go taking your home appliances apart, okay? You don't have to reenact my childhood in order to do this. You can simply go to Home Depot and buy a solenoid valve in the gardening section for about 10 bucks, all right? Now, let's see. Roger Moore, are you back there? Yes, absolutely. All right, here we go. I'm going to point this same barrel up there. We're going to see what happens when we let the air out. And we let the air push. You know what? Turn, come right over here, Steve. Turn yourself around and look down the barrel, because that's a really cool shot. OK. Ready? Everybody raise your right hand. I promise 
When the air cannon goes off, I'll stay in my seat no matter what. All right, promise is a promise. Ready? Fire in the hole. Three. Hang on, let me play with your camera. There we go. Two, one, action! <laughs> wow. All right, if you caught a cotton ball back there, raise your hand. Okay, and who's got the pink one? Okay, so you can see when we fired the pink one, we got about 10 feet off hand pressure. 81 feet to you, young lady, according to the thermometer here. Thank you. Great job. You. Excellent effort. Okay. So we use air cannons like that when you see things being thrown. You see a baseball, a beer bottle, anything that's thrown on the movie set, we use a cannon like that to throw it because where it goes and how hard it hits are predictable because by setting the amount of pressure in there we can determine how much force we're going to get out of it and once again we're looking for predictability and repeatability now I'm just curious how many of you have seen movies where you've seen someone set on fire All right, keep your hands up so we can write down your names tell your parents what kind of movies you're watching all right Stunt people are the only people I know that get set on fire on purpose. But we are not the only people that get set on fire. It's very important for you to know what to do in case you get set on fire. What do you do if you get set on fire? But you know what? Come on up here. If you get on, set on fire, you have to stop drop and roll you know that right you've learned that already but you know what it's not enough to know something you have to be practiced at it you have to be good at it if it's going to do you any good right it's like a story I read about this kid who was interested in stars and he read a book about the stars and he became an astronomer and his friend read a book about swimming and went out and drowned. <laughs> so you can't get it all out of books. Sometimes you have to do things. Can you show us what stop, drop, and roll looks like? Ready? You're on fire. Go. <laughs> Very nice work. Awesome. Good job. All right. Nice work. I'll let you go be safe. All right. When I'm being set on fire, I'm exposed to a lot of heat. And I have come through experience to know that you don't want to be exposed to too much heat. So when I'm set on fire, what I like to have is something in between me and the fire to block the flow of energy from reaching my body. That means I need to have some kind of chemical, some material that won't let the energy through. And what do you think we call materials that block the flow of energy? It starts with an I N S U. Insulation, right. Insulations are materials that resist the flow of energy. Now, when it was nice and cold out this morning, and you put on a warm coat so you could go outside, that coat is an insulator. It blocks the flow of heat. Does that mean that you could put on a nice warm coat when you're going to be set on fire to protect you? No, because nice warm coats are not non-flammable. They burn. Okay? There's electricity in here, but I don't get shocked when I touch this because this rubber is an insulator that keeps electricity inside. So you have to make sure that you always pick the right type of insulation for the material, for the energy that you want to block. And the right type of insulation when you're being set on fire is a material called Zell Gel. It was invented by a scientist named Gary Zeller, and I learned all about special effects by apprenticing to Dr. Zeller for about three years. And like most of uh, the people that I respect in the business, had a good education in science. He had a doctorate in polymer chemistry. And he came up with this fun stuff called Zell Gel. He won an Academy Award for it. And I'm going to show you how it works. The first thing that I'm going to have to have, though, is somebody who can put me out in case I get caught on fire. You know what? I'm going to grab you. I trust you. 
Put these goggles on, please. There we go. Let me tighten these up a little bit. Okay. Tell me when I've pinched enough of your hair back here. I get it? Yep. Good. All right. Now, keep an eye on me because I'm squirrely about this stuff. All right. I've got this stuff here called Zell Gel, right? And Zell Gel is what kind of a material? It's an insulator. That means it blocks the flow of, of heat. Yeah. Now I'm going to want to start this fire on my hand, so I'm going to have to bring together the ingredients it takes to make fire, which means that I have to bring together fuel, oxygen, heat, and a chemical reaction. Right. Now I've got this Zell gel on my hand. And I spread this gel out. This is kind of cool stuff. In fact, it's 32 degrees cool. Back on the old Fahrenheit system before I converted to metric. I can't tell you what that is in Celsius. My, uh, metric, my metric conversion is still in the works. Paper got held up at the Vatican, I think. Okay. So I've got this Zell gel on my hand, and now I'm going to add some fuel to it. And this fuel, when we light something on fire, what we're actually doing is we're converting the chemical energy contained within the fuel into light and heat energy. So we do that by taking fuel, oxygen, adding some heat, and starting a chemical reaction, right? Now, right now, I've got a flame burning on my hand that is burning at about 1,800 degrees. Okay? 1,800 degrees. That is... That is more than twice as hot as it gets in Austin in the summer. You can imagine, this is very, very warm. But all that I feel right now on my hand is icy cold Zell gel. Because not only is this gel blocking the flow of heat from reaching my hand, but it's also absorbing heat from my hand. So the longer I do this, the colder my hand gets. Kind of strange, isn't it? So remember now, if I were to want this to go out, which at some point I will, because you get pulled over if you try driving with fire on your hand. <laughs> I need to take away one of the four ingredients that the fire has to have. When we made that firehouse go out, we took away the fuel. When you stop, drop, and roll, you took away the oxygen. The clothing I'm wearing today won't burn because it has been treated with a flame retardant, which takes away the chemical reaction, the last thing that here we could take away would be what? The heat, that's right. I'm going to teach you a method for taking away heat. It was developed by a young lady in the 1880s. Her name was Goldilocks. And she developed this method originally for cooling porridge. But we found that it also works for putting out flaming stunt people. What I'd like you to do is just take a deep breath and we will now use the property of convection to blow the heat away and take away the fire. Very nice work. Thank you. That's the most important part of the show. Thank you. You know what? Would you like to keep these? You might need them sometime. Okay. Now, I think you guys are getting really good grasp of the safety and the science concepts that we use in movie making. So you know what I think we should try? I think we should try making a movie of our own. And get that thing out of here. Now, when we go to make a movie, there are some misguided individuals who think that there is something more important than the stunts and the special effects in the movie. Some people actually think that it is the actors that make the movie. Would you step up here? and leave anything breakable in your seat. <laughs> now, today we are going to make a movie about a 400-pound gorilla that lives in the zoo. So, would you show me your best... <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. I'm now, a parent. Hmm? I'm a parent. Good. Well, then you're used to having to growl. Now, you're also probably used to having to stay in your room for your own safety, right? Now, this gorilla 
He lives in this teeny little cage. He has a very sad life. Stuck in this little cage every day of his life for the last 10 years. It's pretty bad, isn't it? In fact, he would have given up on life a long time ago were it not for the fact that every morning at exactly 8.15, do you know what happens? A lovely young zookeeper comes and she brings him his favorite meal. And you know what that is? Bananas. Bananas, of course. You have to bring him his banana and feed him. In fact, you have a very complicated job as the lead zookeeper here. It is your job to come in here and you've got to feed him the banana and ask him how his night was, make sure he slept well, and then you're supposed to lock his cage and go feed the penguins. And do you know what penguins eat? Fish. Fish, that's right. And then you feed the giraffe, and you know what they eat? Leaves. Leaves, and you have to feed the hippos, and they eat the oh, penguins, wow. right? <laughs> it's easy to make a mistake in that job, isn't it? And you know what you forgot to do this morning after you fed him and you turned away to go feed the penguins? What'd you forget to do? Lock the cage. Lock the cage. That's right. And you know what that means? Ten years of waiting for the perfect moment Whoa. to escape have arrived. Today's your day. Armed with the 357 Magnum Chiquita Banana, you are now going to bust out of this place. You've got a plan. Your plan is you wait till she turns her back on you, and then using your hands like two opposing wedges, you will growl and slam your hands together, forcing the banana out with a sufficient velocity that's a science word for speed, to hit her in the back of the head and knock her out. That is your plan. Knock her out and then escape. Okay. All right? Now, don't worry, all right? This is not a live loaded banana, okay? <laughs> this is a movie prop banana. If I drop it, you'll see. It doesn't bruise, it bounces, okay? But you always want to check before you point a banana at someone, make sure it's not loaded. So you, you can see inside there, the chamber's clear, the chamber's clear. <laughs> One thing I learned from working on movies is that you cannot tell by looking at guns whether they're real or not. Because the guns that we use in movies, even though they look very real, and they shoot smoke, and they shoot fire, and they make noise, they are not real. They are blank guns. All that comes out of movie guns are smoke, fire, and noise. What, what doesn't come out of movie guns? Bullets. Bullets, that's right. So you need to know, because you can't tell by looking at a gun, what to do if you find one, and what do you do? You stop and you don't touch it, and you leave the area and you go get a grown-up, right? Understand? Because if we don't understand all the safety behind a stunt, we can't do the stunt. So. I'd like you to hang on to this banana now that we've checked to make sure that it is actually safe. Now, what we're going to do with you is we're going to start with your back to the gorilla. Oh my goodness, how can you make a movie without a megaphone? Did I bring my megaphone with me? Here we go. We are going to have a rehearsal. Now, have you ever done this before? Be honest. No. Okay. You've never run away from a gorilla while he shot a banana at you. No. All right. So you're, you're learning a new skill now, aren't you? Uh -huh. Okay. This is going to be for your resume. Okay. Now, when you're learning a new skill on a movie set, we call that rehearsal. But for kids at home, you call that homework. Homework and rehearsal is the same thing. You're just practicing something you haven't done before so that you can get really good at it. All right? So what we're going to do in our movie here is we're going to have you start right up with your back to the gorilla. And when he growls, it is just so terrifying that you scream and you run to get away as fast as you can. You're going to run right down this way, okay? okay? Now, what I need to figure out on the special effects end of this, because you've seen the term stunts and special effects bandied about interchangeably, stunts are the part that talented performers do. Special effects are the part that the scientists do. We have to work together. So the special effects part of this is, what's going to happen as you're running away and you fire that banana? Remember, this is a kid's movie. 
So the answer is not that you're going to get shot. Okay. okay, this is a Disney movie. That means, one, nobody gets shot. Two, nobody gets paid very much. All right? So in this script, what's really going to happen is when that banana gun goes off, we're going to have the banana hit a flower pot and blow the flowers up into the air. So my science challenge is, how am I going to get those flowers to blow up into the air? Now, all good science starts with listening to directions, right? And what did the director tell me? Do what to the flowers? Blow them up into the air. Boom! If I want to get these flowers to go up in the air, I'm going to have to get a bunch of gas under them, and the gas is going to have to go up. Well, how am I going to get a whole bunch of gas underneath this flower? I am going to put some fuel underneath there that burns very, very quickly. I'm going to start a chemical reaction where I'm going to turn something that's a solid into a gas. And it burns really, really fast, much faster than this stuff called propane. In fact, the material that we're putting in this flower pot burns so fast that we don't even call it burning. We call it detonating. And when something detonates, what we really mean is that it is burning faster than the speed of sound. That's fast. That's 1,100 feet per second. So we're going to start that chemical reaction in there. And we're going to, what do you think we call things that burn faster than the speed of sound? We call them what? E-X-P-L-O. Pyrotechnics, exactly. Yeah, they're called explosives. And they're things that just burn really, really fast. Now, how do we start the chemical reaction that's going to turn this stuff from a solid to a gas? To start a chemical reaction, remember, we sometimes have to add some heat to get the chemical reaction going, right? So I guess while you run past these flowers, I'll stand here and light that pyrotechnic device, right? No, what would be wrong with that? Yeah, you'd see me. It would look like a movie about a bald special effects guy who, who tortures flowers with a blowtorch. And that's not the movie, that, that's not that kind of movie. So I've got to find a better way to start this chemical reaction in here, okay? I need to start with heat, but I don't have to end up with heat. And thanks to a wonderful law of thermodynamics, I found out that even though I can't create or destroy energy, you know what I can do? I can change it from one form to another. So just because I need to end up with heat there doesn't mean I have to start with heat. I could start with something called electricity. And I've got a whole bunch of electricity stored up in this thing called a what? A battery. A battery has got billions and gazillions of these little things called electrons. And right now, they're all clustered up here around the negative terminal. But if I do something called making an electric circuit, which is just a circle that electricity travels in, I could get these electrons to do some work for me. Now, I'm going to play a nasty little trick on these electrons, though. I'm going to conduct these electrons down through a wire. And when they race down through this big fat wire with plenty of room, all of a sudden I'm going to make the wire really narrow and they're going to start bumping into each other. And when things bump and rub, they create what? Friction. Friction, Friction creates heat. heat. And heat starts chemical reactions, doesn't it? And chemical reactions could burn things and change them from one state to another. So I'm going to take my wires here and get them ready. The special effects department's getting set. OK. And now I've got all my science ready to go. You know what? This is very predictable. I know it's going to do the same thing every time I do it, I hope. 
Now we need to figure out what you're going to do here. Because we need what you do to be just as predictable as what I do. If I make this blow up and you don't run or you don't jump, it's not going to be a good stunt. So I will act your part for you. I will model the behavior that I want you to mimic. Ready? <laughs> ah! Boom! <laughs> now why do I jump up in the air? Because I want it to look like you ran past a really big explosion, okay? So, in order to make this work and look right, you've got to jump really, really high. So first of all, we've got to do our safety review. What are the hazards that could happen to you? You could bump your head on the ceiling, that's right. So don't bump your head on the ceiling, okay? And the next thing I want to make sure is, because gravity is going to be pulling on you, remember part of my job was to make sure we never have Humpty Dumpty landings? I need to make sure we have something nice and soft to catch you, all right? And you know what I have to catch you? I have a professional football wide receiver. I brought with me Christina O'Halloran, the wide receiver for the Austin Outlaws from the National Women's Football Association. <laughs> Woo! Number 85, Christina O'Halloran. Now, Christina, what I'd like you to do, when this lady comes up in the air like a perfectly thrown pass, I want you to catch her. But not like last week. Don't spike her into the ground at the end, okay? <laughs> just, bl just block her. There you go. All right, so I'm going to give you a chance to practice this, okay? Quiet on the set. Rehearsal's up. I will be cueing you, Gorilla. I'm going to say three, two, one, action, Gorilla. And when you hear the action, Gorilla, you growl. And the growl, Miss Zookeeper, is your cue. When he growls, you will scream, run when you reach the flower pot, jump up into the air, and Miss O'Halloran will catch you. Understood? Rehearsal's up. Three, two, one, action, Gorilla. <laughs> Boom. Whoa, very nice. Okay. Can we do that one more time? And once again, make sure that jump starts right at the flower pot. In fact, I'm going to give you a cone here. When you reach that cone, that is where you launch yourself headlong into oblivion. Ready? And action, Gorilla! Boom! Good! Jump from the flower pot out. Okay. Yeah. If you start the jump early, it looks like you're jumping into the explosion. And we want it to look... <laughs> this would just be counterintuitive. We, we want it to look like, as you get to here, that it's actually the exploding flower pot pushing you up into the air. <laughs> Boom. All right? So let's t do that one more time. Quiet on the set. Rehearsal's up. Three times the charm. Three, two, one, action, gorilla! <laughs> Boom! Perfect! That's great! Okay. <clears throat> Don't worry, you're perfectly safe out there. I'll just be behind you with my... Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Okay. By the way, all of our safety equipment today is being furnished by the Sergeant Welsh Company. Okay, I want to make sure we understand exactly what's going to happen, all right? I'm going to call out, pictures up. And when I say pictures up, that means we're really making the movie this time. So no talking on the set, no moving on the set. We don't want to distract our stunt performer. And we certainly don't want to distract our wide receiver, Christine O'Halloran, with the Austin Outlaws. Okay. So, I will then warn everyone that there's an explosion coming up by saying, fire in the hole! And then I'll count down three, two, one, action, gorilla, scream, run, jump. As you jump, I'm going to take these two wires. 
I'm going to make an electric circuit. The electric circuit is going to conduct electricity down through these wires. The electrons will hit into each other and create friction. The friction will make heat. The heat will start a chemical reaction. The chemical reaction is going to turn a solid into a gas, so we have a change of state. And when that gas expands, it's going to create a lot of pressure, and that pressure is going to turn into a force, and that force is going to go kaboom. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Quiet on the soap, and pictures up. Fire in the hole. Three, two, one, action gorilla. Very nice. Great job. Good work. Excellent. Nice work, Mr. Gorilla. Thank you. Good job. Take a bow. That was terrific. Take a bow. Wonderful. Miss O'Halloran, that was terrific. Yay. Another Razzle Dazzle production. Okay. That's kind of fun. Well, that, in, in a nutshell, is how we use stunts, special effects, based on the science that we learned in elementary school. If you have any questions about how we'd make different stunts that you might have seen, or if you'd like to have the Science in the Movies show come to your school, we're certainly happy to do that. You can find us at scienceinthemovies.com. I would like to thank all of the wonderful folks at the University of Texas who put this on. Jay Banner and Mary and Musgrove and Brian and his folks. And I want to thank all of you for choosing to spend your Friday night in such a fun and entertaining way. Because I could not have had this much fun at home as much as I might try. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Christina. And thank our wonderful crew here. Would be happy to answer a couple of questions? Absolutely. Okay, Steve will be happy to answer some questions. If you do have to leave, please do so really quietly. There's no button so we can hear everyone's questions. Okay, thank you. Who has a question? For Mr. Wolf. For the big bad wolf. Yes. Yes. Pardon me? Right. It, pre it prevents burns. It's a flexible, non-flammable insulator. To firefighters. Yes, it is used by firefighters. Even though firefighters wear turnout gear, which provides good insulation on most of their body, they found a lot of time their ears get burned. And so they put that on. In fact, if you have something like a, a water blanket or a, a water gel blanket, it's actually Zell gel that's on the blanket that they throw over you to protect you from the, from the heat. Yeah, put it right on your skin. Yes. Hang on, you know what? I, I can't hear over the, over the chatter. What the questions are? What liquid do we use to make the smoke? We use a glycol based liquid, the sugar based liquid. You breathe enough of it, you put on a lot of weight. <laughs> yes, sir. Was that Zell Gel peanut butter? <laughs> no, that Zell Gel was Zell Gel. It looks like peanut butter. Gary actually mixes the stuff up custom to look like the skin color of whatever stunt performer is going to be wearing it. Yes. We need to kill that mic. Oh. How often can a stuff person wear the Zell gel? Until, until it gets moldy. Yeah. It's, it's effective as long as it's cold, and usually 30 minutes from the time you put it on until the time you finish your stunt. Because the coldness also affects the consistency of it. You don't want it running off. Steve, yes, sir. Let me interrupt for just, just a oh, second. Oh, yes. We have... Uh, some gifts from Sergeant Welch, and the first gift is an hourglass, and it goes to someone who helped us as a volunteer. Woo! <laughs> Terrific. Questions for Steve? 
Yes. What were you burning there on your hand? Uh, I was using that? fuel. But what kind? Of, uh, <laughs> Through an internship, you'll discover all these <laughs> processes of what happens behind the scenes. Yeah. And by the way, despite my best effort, there's no practical course in special effects at UT. The only way to learn this is to go to work for somebody who does it. So for any of you who might be interested in pursuing a career, we usually have, you know, three or four internship positions available during each semester. And then you'll get to see what we use. Otherwise, we, we run the risk of people going home and trying to set themselves on fire. Yes, young lady. How do you get to be a stunt person? Well, you could start with taking some gymnastics classes, taking some science classes. Pardon me? Gymnastics, yes. Gymnastics is a good way to get your body in shape for doing stunt work. She's taking gymnastics. Are you going to be a stunt woman? Well, you and <laughs> think your sister have such a good question. You get some Sergeant Welch industrial strength protective eyewear. Wow, that's cool. Yes, sir. How do you turn a gas into a solid? By taking away the energy. You've got to take away some heat and bring the molecules back together to turn a gas into a solid. So you can do that either by taking away the energy or you can do it by compressing them, squeezing them back to the point where they, they go back to touching each other. Yes, young lady. Um, what temperature does it have to be for a gas to turn into a solid? For a gas to turn into a solid depends on the material that you're working with. Let's just say water. Well, water turns from a gas back into a liquid so at 212 degrees, and it turns from a liquid back into a solid at 32 degrees. Well, they, there's something called sublimation, and sublimation is when something solid evaporates right into becoming a gas. That doesn't typically happen with water, but it does happen with dry ice, which is actually carbon dioxide. Okay. Excellent question. Very good question. Let's see your sign. Let's hold it up to the camera. Girls love science. Yeah. Woo! I know you're going to be a good sign. Another one of our volunteers, we have a cool thermometer. Wow. Sergeant Walt. Awesome. Great job. Yes, sir. What caused the friction in the flower pot? Well, the friction aspect of the flower pot was actually the friction of electrons in this wire bumping up against each other. See, to you and I, this wire looks very thin, doesn't it? But if you're an electron, this looks like a 50-lane highway that you've got to yourself. And so all the electrons come running down this wire thinking they've got all the room in the world. But when we get to the end of the wire, the wire gets very, very narrow, about the thickness of a human, a human hair. And so when the electrons try passing through that teeny little wire, that's when they start bumping into each other, and that creates friction, and the friction creates heat. Good question. Well, these are specially trained stunt flowers. <laughs> And they can do this stunt over and over again without getting hurt. We tried using real flowers, but they got blown to little bits. Yes, sir. The red light is because I think it looks cool. This gentleman right there, standing up. Yes, sir. Sorry? The heat and the explosion together? Yeah. Well, when you have an explosion, you're, you're making a lot of gas, and it also releases heat. Because when we take that solid and we go through that chemical reaction, it also releases a lot of heat. Yes, young lady. Um, is fire a liquid, a solid, or a gas? Fire is neither, but fire actually can only take place with gases. So when you see something that is undergoing a chemical reaction, that chemical reaction can only take place between two gases. So even though you see a solid log in the fireplace, 
that log is actually being heated by the flame and releasing gases, and it's those gases that are burning. When you do the same thing with a candle, it's not the wax that's burning, it's the pool of melted wax being drawn up the wick and turning into a gas, and then that gas is actually reacting to make the fire. Yes, sir. Carbon dioxide is dry ice. And what we made was carbon monoxide, which is the poison gas that's a product of combustion. In this fire, we made carbon monoxide. And we only made a little bit of it so that we wouldn't hurt anybody. But that's a good question. And generally, um, I recommend that you don't make carbon monoxide indoors. <laughs> yes, young lady. Yes. Does it have to be just mixed at the time, or is this something that no. firefighters who are trapped in forests can have yes. on hand to protect themselves? Yeah, you can carry buckets, buckets of it with you. It comes in one gallon, five gallon buckets. So, do they actually use them in forest fires in case that they're surrounded and trapped? Yes, they do. And they, they, they travel with it in the form of what's called a fire blanket. And this is a non flammable blanket that is pre-soaked in Zell gel. And when you pull that over, it makes a very effective insulator. Urgh. Well, it's in there. <laughs> it's got a unique smell, too, doesn't it, Jay? <laughs> and that smell in there is the smell of one of the ingredients in Zell gel called tea tree oil. And tea tree oil is very effective at soothing and relieving burns. So as well as blocking the heat, the Zell gel also has in it burn gel, you know, burn, burn preventative and burn treatment. Yes, sir. That the, I'm sorry. Yes. Isn't an electron less than it is? It is. Yeah, it's way less than the thickness of a human hair. But we launched so many of them down through that big part of the wire that when they got to the small part, they all bunched up and started bumping into each other. And then, of course, once they, cre they bumped into each other and made enough friction to make enough heat to burn that wire apart, then we broke the electric circuit and started the, the, the reaction. Yes, sir? Is gel a liquid or a solid? It is one of the Rocky Roads and mint chips. Red and sweet? Yeah, it's, it's, it's neither. It's actually a, it's a little bit solid and a little bit liquid. Is it a fluid? It is a fluid because it takes the shape of the container that you put it in. Is yes, sir. Yes. We have, a, we have a question from the internet, from the webcast. Yes. This question comes from uh, Nikki from Miss Kirby's second period class. The question is, I have seen people burn the contents of aerosol cans and then have the cans blow up. How do you prevent that from happening with propane cells? Well, with a, with a, first of all, you, uh, you don't light aerosol cans on fire unless you want to have them blow up in your hand. That's a very bad idea. But when we use a propane tank, and I'll bring this right out, if, they, if they're still watching live on the webcast, a propane tank has a backflow flash preventer. And it's, it's this device here that looks like a pancake. And it allows gas to travel up through it in one direction. But in the event that an explosion were being conducted back down through, the, through this, it would push down against a large diaphragm inside here and shut off the flow of fuel. And that, that prevents the spark from being able to travel back down into the propane tank. So, so that, that's what this safety does. Excellent question, second period class. Yes, sir. What's, what's my son's question, actually, what's the biggest explosion you've ever done for the movies? The one you're closest to. <laughs> it doesn't have to be very big. No, 
But uh, I uh, probably 50 gallons of diesel lit with uh, high explosives underneath. We did some really big explosions like that in a movie called Secondhand Lions. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, it can be chilled again. One of the nice things about Zell Gel, though, is that it is sterile and therefore can be used as a burn cream. Once you've had it out and you let it come to room temperature exposed, you would want to use fresh. But if it hasn't been opened, it can come in and out of the fridge and the freezer you know, for, for an indefinite number of times. Yes, sir? Where did you get the firefighter coat? The firefighter coat? I got it from the Globe Firefighter Company. They just gave it to you? Yes, they did. Wasn't that nice of them? Yeah. Yeah. And it happens to be just my size, too. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, the Zell Gel is matching that color? The Zell Gel is colored to match the skin tones of the performer who will wear it. So no matter what color your skin is, they can make some Zell Gel that'll be your skin color so that if you're wearing it on your body and it shows underneath your wardrobe, it doesn't show on camera. It just looks like your skin. Yes, young lady. When like, they put it on actors, um, how do they like, put it on? Do they just like, wrap the whole person in it? Yes. You actually start wearing no clothes and they cover your whole body in icy cold Zell gel and then you put on your fireproof long underwear and then you put on the wardrobe of what you're going to wear and then we put the fuel on on top of you. So you're freezing when you're wearing Zell gel. Uh, Steve, yes, sir. Repeat the questions. So okay. Like... Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, all the way in the back. Why didn't I include them? Plasma is certainly one of the states of matter. It's just not one of the ones that I see very often. So I think about the three most common states of matter. There are plasma and there are other forms of matter beyond plasma. But the most common ones are solids, liquids, and gases. Just like there are really more ice cream flavors than just chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla. But those are the ones that you see most often. There's plasmas, there's gels, there's aerogels, and they're always coming up with new states of matter. The thing is, most of those don't last very long. They're, they're temporary. Hey, they burn out really quickly, like the sun. Steve, here's another intermittent question. Do you use the same materials year after year, or do you, new materials come along that make the special effects safer and better? And that comes from Derek. Well, Derek, uh, the jokes stay around year after year, <laughs> and the rest of the material will change when science changes. Um, the materials that we use in the show are constantly being improved, and er er from performance to performance, we always go through the equipment and we say, how can this be made safer, can it be made stronger, can it be made lighter? So we, we change the material quite often. Yes, sir. Oh. Go ahead. Zell, well, you have to be licensed to get Zell Gel. And to get licensed to use Zell Gel, you have to have apprenticed for at least a year under somebody who knows how to use it properly. So that brings me back to the issue. If you want to learn how to do this, you have to go to work for somebody who knows how to do it, and they'll teach you how to do it safely. Yes, sir. Right, and the way we test that is we put enough weight on it until it falls, and then we back off a little uh, bit. <laughs> right. Right. The branch would be the weak link in the system, wouldn't it? So, well, just the older you get, the more paranoid you get about these things, and you, you get better at anticipating all the things that might go wrong. Um, and then you test. And that's why 
we have our onset time, which is the time by which we're expected to have worked out all the kinks, and then all of the trial and error that leads up to that point. So Testing Steve, with sandbags and weights and stuff like that. Yes. So Steve, the answer to the question is, do you do your own math because you got a degree in physics from Columbia? I don't do my own math. That's, that's why there are kids. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The question was, can you get frostbite from the Zell gel? And uh, conceivably, you could. How low can the temperature go? Then, if you're burning it, does it matter? Well, we keep it right at the right at 32 degrees. And so I usually wear something in between me and the Zell gel, a little air layer of uh, Nomex fireproof underwear, just so that I don't have to feel the icy cold Zell gel on me. Good question. My favorite special effect? It's blowing that flower pot up week, <laughs> week after week for kids in classrooms. Yeah, it's great. Um, they're all fun. What, what's most fun for me about it is the fact that you know, no two scripts are alike and no two, work, no, no two working circumstances are the same. So even if you're bringing the same science from a prior experience, you're always trying to fit it into the current conditions, the current budget and other constraints that work on you. It's the newness that makes it fun. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, okay. Do, you, do you also work on the visual effects or only special effects? I work, the question is whether I worked on visual or just uh, mechanical effects. And I just work on mechanical effects, but I work in conjunction with a visual effects supervisor. So some things it's better to actually blow stuff up or actually make the snow or make the fog and sometimes it's easier to do those things on computer so with a visual effects coordinator we'll discuss and decide what's going to actually be a mechanical effect and what we're going to do with computer generated effects and how the two things are going to blend together or, or if they use miniatures to make a blowing up house right or miniature models or, or small pyrotechnics how, how much influence do you have on those decisions like if they ask you like the, the safety, factors. safety number one yeah yeah safety then budget then time which comes back to budget so, so have you been able to make those kind of decisions in, in a sure movie lots of times yeah so in a movie called beyond the prairie it's supposed to be snowing we filmed it in a you know on a 98 degree day in Elgin so we had to figure out how we're going to make snow. Now I can make snow in any temperature with a, you know, a synthetic snow. But we didn't want to snow mechanically as far as the camera could see. And the camera could see miles out into the fields. So what we decided to do was use movie snow, you know, the mechanical snow that I make, in the foreground shot so that the actors could interact with it and make footprints and make snowballs and then use computer generated snow in the background and so the visual effects coordinator and I coordinate at what point the real snow stops and the computer snow starts yes yes yeah. And we'll be in Corpus next week. You can go to uh, scienceinthemovies.com and look at our schedule and you'll see which schools we're going to be at. Or we can uh, send you a disc or both. Okay. Well, then you can see Steve next week in Corpus. Uh, Kevin asks... And we hope you feel better. And he hopes you feel better. <laughs> Kevin asks, have you ever gotten hurt while doing this stuff? And Samantha asks, how many people are in your crew? Um, my... My standard fixed crew is about a half a dozen people, and then we can swell to upwards of 50 people depending on the needs of the production that we're working on. And have I ever gotten hurt? Um, I took a really bad bounce once when uh, I didn't get paid up front and my, the check bounced. <laughs> but no, I have, I have never, never been seriously injured in a stunt. Yes, young lady. 
What kind of qualifications do I look for? What kind of education would an apprentice need to have? Oh, they would have to have been well raised. <laughs> and that's actually the most important thing I look for. You know, the science, I can teach somebody. The safety, I can teach somebody. I can't teach somebody to be polite, to be prompt, to be professional. Those are all things that fall back on their parents. So people that are persistent, polite, professional, prompt, physically fit, psychologically stable, they all start with P. Um, that, that's what I look for. The rest I can teach. Yes, sir? When you're applying the gel, does it matter the thickness when you apply it? It certainly does. And the thicker you put it, the question is when we're applying Zell gel, does the thickness matter? And yes, the thickness of an insulation determines its ability to block the flow of energy. So just uh, like if you look in the hardware store at the insulation that they put in people's houses, you have R13, R19, R23, it refers to the thickness, and the thicker the insulator is, the more energy it can stop. Yes, young lady. How many films have you worked on? I've worked on about 50 films, maybe 200 commercials, and another 100 music videos. Uh, the Firm, The Client, Castaway, The Jungle Book, America's Most Wanted, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, SpongeBob Squarehead. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Yes. What pulleys do is they create something called mechanical advantage. And if you want to calculate the mechanical advantage of a system using pulleys, what you do is you count the number of rope sections that are going to be moving. So in order for this bar here to rise up one foot, nine segments of rope must all be moved one foot. That means I've got to pull nine feet of rope on this end in order to get this thing to go up one foot. That means we're, we're generating something called the mechanical advantage of nine to one. Well, you don't actually get any stronger, but your, your strength becomes more effective. So yes, it's effectively multiplying your strength nine times. And each additional pulley that you use will be a, one more factor of the ability to multiply your effort. So there are nine pulleys here. There are nine rope segments. So this would allow you to lift something nine times heavier than you are. Yes, sir. Any phobias? Any phobias? Well, a phobia is defined as an irrational fear. And generally, in my work, all my fears are rational. So, uh, you know, if you're working around explosives and fire and high electricity and things blowing up and cars crashing, being afraid of the outcome of those processes is not an irrational fear. It's something that I have to contend with. I have to work through all of the possibilities of things that could go wrong, and I need to come up with scientific and certain ways to make sure that none of those eventual possibilities come out. I need to make sure that the safe solution is the one that ends up on film. Who has, who has a final question for Steve? Yes, young lady. Um, that firefly, does it ever explode on someone? No, it explodes right, be right behind people. So never, on top of them. never on top of them. The day it does that, I fire it and I get a new flower pot. Because the, the flower pot, of course, is not part of the decision-making process. And you'll, uh, you'll notice that actually um, there's, no, there's no computers up here that control anything. The final control about when that electric circuit happens goes off, is based on what? Wires. Yeah, and who's holding the wires? Right, because I'm responsible for the safety of that person, not... Mac or Windows or anything else, me. I touch this and I touch that and it goes off. 
and I don't fire those explosives unless I'm looking personally at that flower pot and I see that the person has run in front of them and that they're safely clear and that no audience members or crew members have gotten within 10 feet of the flower pot. So there's a lot of places where human common sense is the best safety solution. Well, Steve and his crew have a lot of cleaning up and packing up to do. We sure do. Um, and, <laughs> and we can use all the help. <laughs> have to answer some questions if you sort of stay off the stage and let us crew do this thing, but you can come up and maybe ask questions. And let's thank him again for it. Thank you. And please pass my thanks to my crew and to the folks at API Productions for coming out here and videotaping this. Christine O'Halloran and the Outlaws, Jessica Shahan, Kristen Phil, Jesse Moorfield, John Foyles.